here to dive into industry trends with leading ETF experts. This is ETF Spotlight with Nina Mishra. Hello and welcome to ETF Spotlight. I'm your host Nina Mishra. My guest today is Ryan McCormick, QQQ strategist at Invesco. We're talking about the Invesco QQQ ETF, which is one of the most popular and most actively traded ETFs in the world. It has over 96 billion, billion in assets. And it is also one of the top performing ETFs of the past decade. Ryan, welcome and thanks for joining us. Thanks so much, Nina. Great to be here. Okay, so QQQ celebrated its 20th birthday last year. Tell us a little bit about it, his, its history, and how it got the ticker symbol QQQ. And uh, it was actually four Qs earlier, right? And it became three Qs later, and probably in 2011. Yes, the, uh, the the name is something that, that's kind of uh, in, in in almost finance war. There's a lot of uh, a lot of questions about how they they got the name, but. Um, you know, like you said, QQQ has been around for for 20 years, which is uh, it was a pretty big milestone for us to celebrate last year because yes. there's really only a handful of ETFs out there that that can say that they have a, a live 20 year track record. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I I think in the early days of of, of QQQ, initially they they wanted the ticker to to be just one Q, okay. so just the ticker Q. Mm -hmm. um, the problem is uh, it was listed on uh, the Amex, the American Stock Exchange, and, and one-letter tickers were uh, reserved for the New York Stock Exchange only. Mm -hmm. um, so what they did was I, I, at that point they, they made the ticker QQQ, and I believe Q was chosen because NASDAQ ends in Q. Okay. So initially it was three Qs. Uh, they changed it, as you said, to four Qs. Um, in 2004, um, that's when they listed on the NASDAQ exchange, and NASDAQ had rules that um, you needed to have a four-letter ticker uh, to be listed on NASDAQ. Uh, fast forward to 2011, uh, when NASDAQ allowed three-letter tickers, and we kind of round-tripped it, so QQQ was back to just three letters, QQQ. <laughs> okay, very interesting. So uh, QQQ is obviously, as I mentioned, it's very popular, but... Uh, even though it's so popular, many investors do not understand the product properly. In fact, most investors, I think they think that uh, QQQ is a tech ETF, uh, whereas it is actually a large cap growth ETF. Uh, so tell us a little bit uh, about the index, how stocks are included and weighted in the index. Sure. Um, so, so I think when you when you're looking at at um, the index, it's, it's it's a very simple to understand strategy. Um, QQQ tracks the Nasdaq 100, which is the 100 largest stocks listed on the Nasdaq exchange. X financials. Mm -hmm. um, it's X financials because when the the, the indices um, were created back in 1985, um, they had a separate index just for financials. Mm -hmm. So the NASDAQ 100, again, um, was designed to track the 100 largest um, stocks that were listed on the NASDAQ exchange. And I think as you look back through history, um, specifically in the late 90s and early 2000s, you started to see um, QQQ become a tech proxy, mm -hmm. where investors thought of it as strictly a tech fund, um, and, you know, for good reason, right? It, it, it was up in, in the 80 percent range exposure to technology names back in the in the middle of, of the dot com bubble. Um, so I think you you sort of get that um, you know almost that, that recognition of oh QQQ that's a tech fund. Um, but I think now since you know there's been significant changes in the marketplace since since 1999 and 2000 when when you start to look at at the sectors that make up QQQ, yes. It, technology is still a pretty significant overweight, and we're about 46% technology in the fund. Mm -hmm. But beyond that, we have very significant allocations to um, communication services, which is up near 20%, um, consumer discretionary names, um, where we have about 14%. Uh, those three sectors are our three largest overweights relative to the S&P 500. Uh, but there's also pretty significant exposure to healthcare as well. So... Um, you know, certainly we like to say QQQ is, is a large growth ETF. It fits firmly in that large cap growth um, sort of bucket. Um, 
but it is much more than than, than just the tech fund. Okay, great. So as I mentioned earlier, it is one of the top performing ETFs of the past decade and the last year also. Uh, so tell us what factors are contributing to this impressive performance. I think that, that when we're looking at performance over the past, as you said, 10 years or, or, or even one year, right, it's important to know, and I'm a very big proponent of, of knowing what you own. Mm-hmm. Meaning, when you're buying an ETF, sure, QQQ is a is a large growth ETF, but like, you know, what really am I am I owning here? And and, and looking under under the hood, understanding the, you know, the number of holdings, the the, the sectors that 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 you have exposure to, and obviously we just went through some of our our, our largest um, overweight sectors, but beyond that, um, Q's is just made up of a hundred holdings, right? So it's going to be a fairly concentrated, generally fairly top heavy. Um, portfolio of, of of growth stocks, and within that, right, the the, the overweight sectors are going to play a, a very big hand in, in 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 that overall performance because there's so few names. But generally, what we'll see is a handful of stocks that are driving, uh, you know, a, a pretty good portion of overall performance. Um, you know, th- th- that has not been um, any surprise as we look at last year's performance, as we look at the performance over the past 10 years. Um, it has been driven by our significant overweight to information technology, communication services, and, communica- and uh, consumer discretionary. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think if you, you take a step further or we move beyond your, your sort of traditional size and style box into – you know, you, you mentioned factors, sort of, you know, what, what factors have been have been driving the performance. Well, relative to the S&P 500, um, QQQ is, is long growth. And, you know, depending on the time frame, and, and, and certainly over the past couple of years, it's been long quality, which mm-hmm. I think may um, surprise a lot of folks. Um, relative to the S&P 500, we're, we're short dividend yield and we are um, short value. So because I think as you look at, you know, the past 10 years, it's been a pretty growth-dominated market. Um, the fact that we're short value names relative to the S&P, that, help, that has helped us in relative performance, along with the fact that, you know, we, we, we do have significant exposure to, to those growth stocks that have been driving the market. Okay, uh, excellent. So, uh, obviously, as you mentioned, uh, the ETF's heavy weighting to technology and communication services, which was actually carved out of technology sector in 2018, that has paid off in a big way in the past 10 years. Uh, do you expect the ETF to continue to benefit from that weighting in the future too? Uh, technology was the best performing sector last year, up more than 50%. Communication services was the second best, best performing. And this year as well, technology is the best performing sector. It's up about 10%. Uh, but there are many concerns uh, related to big tech stocks. And just yesterday, we learned that FTC is expanding its uh, antitrust investigation into big tech. Uh, They are demanding more information from um, Amazon, Facebook, Alphabet and Microsoft regarding their acquisitions. And in general, there is a feeling that these companies have grown so big and powerful that they are just killing competition. Uh, So there may be more antitrust investigation. There are concerns related to data privacy. There are concerns related to valuation. So uh, do you think this outperformance can continue in the future too? I think when you when you take a step back, I mean, you know, it, it's very hard to say, you know, what what will outperform, right? Mm-hmm. If, if we knew that, I think we'd all be doing this podcast from our from our private island that we right. own. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, when you're looking at for to, to to start market environment, right? The, the stage is is somewhat set for stocks to outperform bonds and growth to continue to outperform value. And that's because, you know, we, we see somewhat, you know, muted growth here domestically, mm-hmm. right? We've kind of been hovering around that, that 2%. Um, stable growth and, and, and growth nonetheless, but, you know, uh, certainly not, not huge economic um, uh, economic growth. Mm-hmm. Beyond that, we have a, a pretty accommodative Fed, um, given, you know, three rate cuts last year and, and you know, three consecutive rate cuts last year. Um, now they've indicated that they haven't. You know, th- th- there's probably not a ton of action on the table for for this year. But that being said, I would still argue that we're in a pretty accommodative Fed environment. Mm-hmm. And beyond that, not a lot of inflation to write home about. So, you know, in terms of of, of, of 
that sort of scenario, you know, that does paint the picture for, for, for um, growth stocks to continue to do very well. Mm-hmm. Um, when we look at, at, at the companies specifically, um, you look at the earnings reports from, from, from Q4 um, from a lot of these heavyweights, whether it be Apple, whether it be Amazon, whether it be Microsoft, um, and, and, and earnings were, were, were fantastic. Right, right. Um, you know, you, you, you saw unbelievable iPhone sales out of Apple. You saw, you know, one of the best, if not the best, holiday shopping season as reported by Amazon. You've seen continued expansion of, of cloud services, which is, is, you know, benefits Microsoft and their, their expansion, expansion of their Azure platform along with Amazon Web Services. Um, my point being that, um, you know, these stocks have almost become um, the drivers of this new economy, right? I mean, they're, they're consistently innovating. They're consistently um, bringing new businesses to the forefront. Um, and it kind of along the way are driving costs down. Um, mm-hmm. So they've made it a very competitive market environment. But I think when, when you're looking at, at um, the performance of these underlying companies, um, it's been nothing short of, of, of fantastic, both from the stock price and, and, and underlying business. Mm-hmm. Um, you mentioned another concern being um, being valuation, and uh, maybe unsurprisingly, because um, this was a very tech focused fund. Uh, when you look back at the tech bubble in in ninety nine and two thousand, um, the valuation is something that gets that brought up often, right? Because the valuation on a lot of these tech stocks were were astronomical. Right. Um, if you look at valuation of, of sort of the top five holdings of QQQ then versus now, um, it, it's not even a comparison. Mm-hmm. Um, you, you would essentially need um, our top five holdings to triple in a day um, to equal um, mm-hmm. the, 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 the PEs of back in, in, in 99. Um, and beyond that, you know, I, I think they're, they're just very different businesses. If you, you, you go back to, to 1999, a lot of these tech companies were just starting out, right? It, it, it only took you uh, it, to essentially have a website to be considered a tech company. Mm-hmm. But that is, that is not the case today. Um, today, technology, quote, unquote, is, is, is everywhere, right? Whether it be finance and looking at algorithms and computing power, whether that be um, in autos, right? They say that uh, the, average, uh, the, the average automobile on the road has more uh, technological components than the first spaceship that went to the moon. Um, technology, whether you, you know, whether you like it or not, is, is a part of our, our daily lives and, and, and a part of, of, of this growing economy. So these companies look very different from what they did in, in 1999. Tremendous sales numbers, tremendous earnings numbers. Um, so I, I think uh, as you look at that comparison, there really isn't one because the, 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 the environment has changed so drastically um, over the past 20 years. I agree with you. Uh, these companies continue to report excellent results quarter after quarter after quarter. They have just become cash generating machines. And uh, that is why investors are not concerned about the valuations uh, because they are willing to pay for that growth. These companies are investing so much in automation, you know, AI, cloud computing, all those areas that are go- areas that are going to drive uh, growth in the future as well. And that is why big tech is just, uh, it just keeps getting bigger. And uh, if I look at the top holdings of the ETF as of now, Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Google, and Facebook. Uh, these are the top five holdings. And, uh, the ETF is a big uh, top heavy. These top five holdings account for almost 45% of the portfolio. That is just because they keep getting bigger and bigger every quarter. Uh, so could you tell us a little bit about some of the top holdings, either these or any other top holdings that you find very innovative? Well, yeah, I, you know, I think when you look at innovation as, as, on the whole, uh, it, 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 it extends much further than just the top five holdings. Mm-hmm. Um, we like to look at, at, at QQQ um, broadly and say when, you, when you're investing there, you're also getting exposure to, to innovation. Um, and, you know, I, 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 uh, in, in, a, in a number of different um, arenas, um, we like to say that it's very hard to quantify innovation. So in, in looking at these names and, and, and the way that they're doing business, we, we try to um, center around R&D spending mm-hmm. as a good proxy for innovation. And what we found is, on the whole, when you're looking at, at um, the NASDAQ 100, 
the companies that comprise the index um, are reinvesting in R&D at twice the rate of the S&P 500. Mm-hmm. So I think when you're looking at these companies, there is a consistent commitment to innovation and, again, taking those dollars and reinvesting to try to find the next chapter, right? And, and you'll look at – take Amazon, for instance um, – Amazon as a company looks a lot different today than it did 20, 10, even five years ago. Microsoft, I think, would be would be another example of that, right? I mean, they've made significant, significant um, strides in, in their cloud computing um, platform, right. which you know, at the tech bubble and, and even 10 years ago was was something that didn't exist, mm-hmm. right? So these companies are are are. Are, are reinvesting and are at the forefront of, of innovation because I think information and, and, and changes here in this marketplace happen so quickly. If they are not at the cusp or the cutting edge of, of, of that innovation, they will be left behind. Mm-hmm. So broadly, I would say, as you look at QQQ, um, investing in this index will give you exposure to, to a lot of that innovation. So tell us, what else uh, do investors need to know about investing in QQQ? How does uh, the CTF fit into an investor's portfolio? I would say, you know, if you're looking at, again, sort of your your traditional size and style boxes, this would be very clearly um, in your large cap growth area. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, from a factor perspective, as as I said, you'll you'll get that exposure to growth. You will get some exposure to, uh, to quality. Um, and it, again, I think it's just important to know what you own. It's going to be a very concentrated, uh, concentrated basket of, of, of 100 names. Um, the, the, the sort of top holdings are going to be the ones that drive a lot of that outperformance. But um, you know, you're going to get exposure to growthy, innovative companies that uh, again are at the forefront of a lot of uh, a lot of these advancements in the uh, in the new economy. Okay, so uh, since I have you on the show, I have to ask you about Tesla too, because it is the biggest story in the stock market over the past few months. Uh, Tesla shares have gained over 200% uh, since the company reported a surprising quarterly profit in October last year, and shares are up about 80% this year itself. And in fact, uh, the NASDAQ 100 is the only major index which includes Tesla. So Tesla is uh, a part of uh, QQQ's portfolio, though a very small weighting, about 1.5%, I think. Uh, But what are your thoughts on Tesla's parabolic surge? Yeah, you know, I, I, and I think this is sort of a, a, a perfect example of the, the, the type of exposure, the type of name that you'll get um, investing in, in, in QQQ. Um, you know, as you said, uh, it, it is, uh, it, it, it's a fairly small weighting, um, but uh, at about, you know, 1.45, yeah, we'll round up to uh, 1.5%. If you could believe it, back in August of last year, the, the weighting was under 0.5%. Mm-hmm. Wow. So you can see the, the, the as you said, the parabolic um, growth in, in, in the stock price here uh, has, has ballooned it to um, the 14th largest holding within um, the ETF, again, that, uh, you know, around 1.5%. Um, the stock rise has been incredible beyond the, the, the third quarter earnings. Uh, fourth quarter earnings that were um, announced in the, the, the last week of January showed uh, a lot of promise as well. Yes. Um, this is all in the face of the kind of expiring uh, electronic vehicle tax credit this year. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think as you start to look, surprise earnings um, in Q3 and Q4 of, 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 of last year where they're actually posting positive earnings, uh, posting a significant amount of, of, of free cash flow. You get a lot of um, a lot of pretty p- positive developments in terms of global deliveries, in terms of their their, their, their factory in China. So, um, you know, if you look at, at, at a company uh, for sort of a growth poster child um, over the past six months, I don't know that you can come up with a better example than Tesla. Excellent. That's all we have time for today, Ryan. Thanks again for joining us. Thanks so much, Anya. Thanks for listening. If you want to learn more about the CTF, please visit Invesco.com. Make sure to be on the lookout for the next edition of ETF Spotlight and also make sure to subscribe. If you have any comments or questions, please email podcast at zax.com.
This material is being provided for informational purposes only, and nothing herein constitutes investment, legal, accounting, or tax advice, or a recommendation to buy, sell, or hold a security. Do not act or rely upon the information and advice given in this podcast without seeking the services of competent and professional legal, tax, or accounting counsel. Publication and distribution of this podcast is not intended to create, and the information contained herein does not constitute an attorney-client relationship. No recommendation or advice is being given as to whether any investment or strategy is suitable for a particular investor. It should not be assumed that any investments in securities, companies, sectors, or markets identified and described were or will be profitable. All information is current as of the date herein and is subject to change without notice. Any views or opinions expressed may not reflect those of Zach's Investment Research as a whole.